Let's stand one more time for Romans 12, if you're able to stand, just out of reverence and respect for the uh, everlasting word of God. And we'll read these two verses once more. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, I'll read these two verses, and then I'll say, this is God's word. If you agree this is God's word, would you all say together, thanks be to God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is God's word. You may be seated. We are a church that is transformed by the power of the gospel, that lives by faith and is known by our love. We strive to worship the living God, treasure Jesus Christ, and serve in the power of the Spirit. His word is our delight and our foundation. We aim to be a voice of truth and hope for our community to seek out the lost for salvation and disciple all believers into maturity in Christ for the glory of God alone. That's what you'll have memorized next. What is that? Our mission statement, our mission statement. That's what we've been uh, sort of reflecting on the last three weeks and wrapping up this morning. One of the most daunting tasks of being a pastor is being the dude in the driver's seat. Praise the Lord we have elders. And I'm not the only dude in the driver's seat. You know what I mean there, right? But you can ask my wife. I'm not the best with directions. I remember my first year of college, um, I was doing like Alexandra, driving back and forth from Raleigh, not to here, but to Sumter, South Carolina. Um, And I made that trip several times. And after doing it several times, I got pretty confident. I said, I don't need this GPS some of you young folks, we used to have a thing called a tom-tom, or if you were really fancy, you had a Garmin, and it stuck on the windshield of your car, my old Saturn Ion, and uh, I would drive back and forth uh, using that thing from Wake Forest, North Carolina, to Manning, South Carolina, and after doing that so many times, you know, I thought, I, I think I've got it now. I think I can just turn this thing off and just go home for Christmas I know where to go. I know the highway. I know which exits. I'm, I think I've got this. So I just turned it off. And after driving and driving and driving and driving, I realized these signs look different. I should have hit South Carolina by now. Why, why am I going further west? And I uh, felt too good for the GPS, and I managed to turn a four-hour trip into a six-hour trip. And to this day, anytime we travel and I say to Mariana, I I think I've got it from here. She says, let's just keep it on just in case. Just in case. Unfortunately, sometimes pastors and churches also take this approach when it comes to things like mission and purpose and vision and all the buzzwords that we try to use, right? And we get overly confident with our innate directional skills I mean, I'm just going to turn it off the rest of the way. I think we know what we're doing. We've got it figured out now. And we hear pastors make proposals to their churches as if they are the Pope. And they got this proposal directly from God's throne himself. God told me it's time to start a new giving campaign and raise money for a new building. God told me we need to hire a youth pastor. God told me we need to stop doing this thing and start doing this thing. And by this hyper-spiritual language, we put the pastor on a pedestal in which nobody is allowed to disagree with him or search the scriptures. And they say, well, if God told him, what am I supposed to say to that? Be found disagreeing with God? What the pastor wants is not the mission of the church. What I want, what our elders want, what you want is not the mission of the church. Pastor Mez McConnell is a Scottish uh, pastor, and uh, I really like him. He, he gives some liberating advice here about how churches talk about vision and purpose and direction. He says, 
Apparently, hence a little bit of that Scottish sarcasm here. Apparently, our church need visions, our churches need vision statements, and individuals need personal vision targets in order to progress in the kingdom of God. Because after all, it is biblical, or at least it sounds biblical. Just look at Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Excellent. Now let me get on with my post about vision statements. He says, let's get on with a bit of vision casting or some other similarly spiritual sounding phrase. Except the ESV, this verse reads somewhat differently, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. So what we see is that this verse isn't really about business plans, vision casting, or prophetic ecstasies. This is actually a verse written for the community of God's people about the danger of neglecting God's revelation. The more we neglect the word of God, the more chaos we are going to sow in our lives and in our churches. So we believe at Main Street, our mission strategy isn't really all that unique. In fact, it's arguably the same mission that every Bible-believing, Christ-exalting church on the planet is pursuing. What we do, God has told us to do, revealed to us in his word. The church's mission is not a mystery or a secret to be found out. Jesus didn't start building his church and then sort of leave us hanging to figure it out for what's next. Now, of course, there are distinctives and flavors to every church and every time and place and people that sort of distinguish us, and we have unique callings where we are at our church at this time with who we are. You know, that, that matters, and we do need competent leaders to sort of act on those things and take the best next step for where we are. But um, as we reach this third week in the exposition of Romans 12, 1 and 2, we see Paul's appeal end with a final resolve to be unwaveringly committed to the will of God. Unwaveringly committed to the will of God. And the will of God is a biblical subject that confuses many of us. I remember as a new Christian feeling paralyzed at times, wondering, am I in God's will? If I do this or do that, is this God's will or is that God's will? How do I know the right thing to do? How do I know if I'm walking in God's will? Some of you today may have these kinds of fears. Beloved, if we're doing church right, and if we're doing Christianity right, the will of God should not be something strange and far off, but something we know and love and follow with clearness and eagerness and zeal. God has revealed himself. God wants to be known by us. God is not hiding. The more we know of him, the better worshipers we will be, and the more confident we will be about his will and his plans for us. So let me just review a little bit here, and you can go back and catch the two previous sermons on this text. And by the way, Lord willing, we'll be back in Acts chapter 9 uh, next Sunday to continue our study there. So y'all can read that for next week. Uh, But the appeal is, Romans 12, By the mercies of God, give your body away as spiritual worship, as a living sacrifice to God, and refuse conformity with the world by being transformed with your mind renewed. So first, our bodies are sacrificed to God as worship, Whatever we do, whatever we drink, whatever we eat, do it to the glory of God with your physical bodies. Worship with your bodies. Give your body, your physical body, to to spiritual worship. God gave us a body. Our bodies are good. God is pleased when we use them in holy and acceptable ways, right? Number two, refuse conformity to the world by the renewal of your mind. So give your life, not to the world, but to God. The world, or this age, right? This age is ignorant and blinded by the lies of Satan like we used to be. We know what worldliness is based on who we used to be. That is our definition of worldliness. Don't go back to the old man. Ignorant, 
led by passions of the flesh. No understanding for God and his worldview, right? But now be transformed. Have your mind renewed, recycled, made alive. Once it was debased, now it's gloriously being transformed by the beauty of God's word. And because your mind is now settled on Jesus, you're able to now treasure Jesus with all that you have, wherever you are, whatever you are doing. That renewal process is ongoing, sanctification, right? We're changing day after day after day, year after year, decade after decade, to love Jesus more and more and more. We are a transformed people who treasure Jesus. And as our minds are renewed to treasure Jesus, we learn something about him that changes everything. You know what we learn about Jesus? John chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Transforming hearts, treasuring Christ, teaching truth. Jesus is truth. He is the beam of light that pierced our darkened minds and illumined in us a taste for truth. And all who believe on his name, he gives the right to become children of God, born not of blood, this is still John, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but he says, but of the will of God. God has made Jesus known. We know Jesus. We know truth. We know the will of God. We teach it. His word is our delight and our foundation. We aim to be a voice of truth and hope for our community to seek out the lost for salvation, disciple all believers into maturity in Christ for the glory of God alone. What is God's word? <clears throat> Today... In order to answer that question, we have to use all the right words in order to not be called a heretic, right? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Danny Aiken, president at Southeastern, uh, one of my favorite preachers, honestly. I heard him talk about this recently in a sermon. He said he used to be able to say he believed the Bible was the inspired word of God, but that wasn't enough. So he had to start saying the Bible is the inspired and infallible word of God. But that wasn't enough. So he had to start saying, the Bible is the inspired, infallible, and inerrant word of God. But that wasn't enough. So he had to start saying, the Bible is the verbally inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. But that wasn't enough. So then he had to start saying, finally, the Bible is the verbally inspired, plenary, infallible, inerrant word of God. But then he shared this. Throughout the decades of having to add qualifiers to his doctrine on the Bible, his view never changed. Here is what I submit to you this morning. God's word is truth. Add whatever qualifiers you need to not be deemed a heretic. God's word is truth, right? Right? God's word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory full of grace and truth. And we have renewed minds that treasure Jesus over the world. We delight in the truth now because Jesus has taught us the truth and how to love the truth. And a church that truly loves Jesus will then teach the truth. He renewed our minds through his truth. Now we impart that truth to others, both for their, their salvation and their sanctification. So what does all this have to do with Romans 12, 1 and 2? We're saved by mercy. We present our bodies as living sacrifices to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. That, here it is, finally, the goal of the appeal. That, therefore, here's where we've been going the last two weeks. That by testing, you may discern the will of God. That was it. That's where we were headed all this time. The appeal 
is for a radical, all-consuming lifestyle of spiritual worship. And then the purpose of that appeal is so we can step back and look at ourselves and evaluate the manner of our living and our habits of worship and to see if God's will is in us. If we see living sacrifices, we see God's will. If we see renewed minds, we see God's will. If we see nonconformity to the world and profound transformation, we see God's will. Do you want to know God's will? Paul says, well, let's test for it. Let's test for it. So we test ourselves. That by testing. Now, when the Bible talks about testing, who usually brings the test? Not a trick question. We read James 1 this morning. Tests, trials of various kinds, so be surprised. God, there you go. Somebody's still paying attention. The Lord usually brings these tests in our lives. James 1, 1 Peter 1, both uh, allude to that. But I think Paul is telling us about a different kind of testing here in Romans 12. It's the same word in the Greek. It means to prove, to approve. We usually say innocent until proven guilty, right? Uh, to prove is to find something out, to investigate, to search, to see what's actually there. And we tend to use that word negatively in our culture, but the Greek language uses it positively. It's a connotation to prove something not to be guilty, but to prove something innocent, right? To, to uh, investigate, to search, and to find good things, to find worthy things. Think of Paul telling Timothy, show yourself a worker approved by God. First uh, Timothy 3 says that deacons should first be tested, not for all the bad stuff that they do, but tested to see if they have these godly characteristics in them that he lays out for us in 1 Timothy 3. Look for the good things. 1 John 4 exhorts believers to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Here's how he says you know whether the spirits are from God or not if they confess Jesus as Lord, right? So you're looking for good, positive truth in, in this testing. Look for the people who confess Jesus. That's how you'll know that they're true. That they're true. All, all this to say, <clears throat> this is a kind of testing that we perform, is what I'm getting at. This is a kind of testing that we perform. This is a self-diagnostic test that Paul is calling believers to take to find whether or not they are genuine and approved. And in taking this test, we discover it's an evaluation of our own will, an evaluation of our souls to see if our wants, our desires, our wills parallel with the will of God. By the way, just real quick, for all the good Calvinists back there in the back pews, y'all know we have a free will, right? <laughs> Two of you know that. The, the realist of all Calvinists know that, is what I'm getting at here. We have wills. The Lord is sovereign, and all authority in heaven and earth is given unto him. He does as he pleases. He rules. He reigns. But we got wills, right? If we didn't have wills, this testing would be pointless. We're looking to see if our will is parallel with his will. We good? What we want to find since God is good and acceptable and perfect, things in us that are good and acceptable and perfect. And this comes right off the heels of do not be conformed to the world. So what do we find in ourselves, in our will? Do we find conformity to the world or do we find light? Light. Ephesians 5.8 says at one time you were darkness. You were darkness is what it says. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light, fruit of light, is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. We're to search ourselves for the fruit of light. Paul says the fruit of light in Romans 12 is a sacrificial body and a renewed mind. 
So this is the testing that we've come to at the end of this thing, looking for the fruit of light. Now, you've, you've probably heard about the process for evaluating counterfeit money, money junk. I've heard preachers use this analogy forever. You've probably already heard it, right? Um, do they study the, the fake or do they study the real thing? They study the real thing. Every single final minute little detail they have memorized so when they see the fake, they know it's a fake. They study the real thing, not the fake. Let me give you an analogy that you haven't heard before that is absolutely silly. Uh, I like to do bedtime, all right? One of the greatest things a dad gets to do, and when we do bedtime, we have quite a routine. Um, we read books, we brush teeth, we change the diaper, we do lotion, we do lip balm, we put on her little heart monitor sock so we can make sure her heart's beating all night long, we zip her up in a sleep sack, we give her all the kisses, we turn on a sound machine, we turn the lights off, we start singing, It Is Well. It's her nightly song, and I always wonder if she's going to fall asleep when we sing that on Sundays. Uh, so that's our routine. I don't know if that's just because she's a firstborn or we're just all-star parents. Maybe that sounds crazy to you. Maybe it's just our firstborn. It takes a while, okay? We do all those things, and there's one extra step that I like to throw in. It's called the toe check. The toe check. I zip her up in the sleep sack, and we sit down in the chair together. And it's usually when I'm going to either put some lotion on her legs or do the, uh, the sock thing. I'll say, Isla, it's time for the toe check. And she knows exactly what's about to happen. I'm going to unzip the bottom of the thing. And you know what we're looking for? All 10 toes. If she has all 10 toes, she passes the toe check. So far, she has never failed the toe check. She's got a perfect toe check record. And I <clears throat> zip them back up, and I know that she has all 10 toes because she is a perfectly fine, healthy, growing baby, right? And in the same way, when I unzip that zipper and I expect to see all 10 toes, when we unzip the door to our souls, we ought to expect the fruit of light and a healthy, thriving, spiritual relationship with Jesus. Not because we ourselves are good and true and perfect, but because we are being renewed after the image of our Creator and the Holy Spirit, and we are looking for His work in our lives. So all this means then that we need to employ a regular soul search for fruit. Some of y'all may not have any problems with this because y'all think y'all are all that. Okay, this, this feels weird to talk about even. Look for the good stuff in you. Is that Christian? Aren't we, <laughs> aren't we supposed to like talk about our sin problems? Look for the good stuff. That doesn't sound right. The Bible tells us to look for the good stuff. It also tells us to deal with sins, to confess our sins. It talks a lot about that, right? But here, this is not a self-examination that is supposed to lead to boasting or pride or all kinds of flattery to puff us up and make us feel good about ourselves. This is a testing for two reasons, I believe. First, for assurance. For assurance that Jesus really will complete what he began. If we see any fruit of light within us, it's because God still loves us and hasn't given up on us. He's still conforming us to his will. We don't have to search very long to find sin, right? That's easy. Sometimes we have to really search to find where the Lord is conforming us and renewing our minds. And even if we do still sin, we see these glimmers of light which we are assured by that then the Holy Spirit has not left us, Christ has not forsaken us, and the Father is still pleased to call us children. That fruit that we find tells us that the Father loves us. Secondly, we do this, I think, to keep personal benchmarks. The Christian life is short, but you know what? The Christian life is also long. There are seasons that feel like an eternity of waiting. 
There are some seasons so dark where it feels like we're not growing at all or the race, the race isn't worth running anymore. We're, we're done. We feel like we're never going to make it. But then we look where we were 20 years ago. Or we look where we were five years ago. Or we look where we were last month. And if we're even just a few steps further along in the pilgrimage than the last time we checked, that's a few steps closer home. This is a great encouragement for weary souls that Jesus is still refining us. By God's grace, we are what we are. And he is making us into something. So how are you doing? Can you think of at least one way that you were almost surprised at yourself recently because of the good and acceptable thing that you caught yourself doing? For me, I really have to think. It doesn't come natural, <laughs> I think, for us to think this way. Maybe a time when you used your body as a living sacrifice for worship. A time when you saw the world differently through the renewed lenses of the Holy Spirit within you. Maybe you saw a homeless person and you felt compassion instead of judgment. Is that from you or from Jesus? Maybe you prayed with someone who was anxious, where previously you didn't really want to do stuff like that. Maybe you were tempted to sin, but then there was a, a sweet verse of Scripture that just flew into your brain, and you said no to whatever that sin was. These things become more and more like second nature to us as we grow in Christ, and it's good for us to regularly stop and take inventory and have a self-awareness of how Jesus is Lord and King of our souls and is calling us to submit to him, our wills to his will, and, and being conformed in every way, in every facet of our lives. But wait a minute, what is God's will? <laughs> we still haven't really answered that question, right? So that by testing, that by testing, what does it say? You may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the purpose of the testing is to know and pursue and run after God's will. We do the self-evaluation to find the fruit so we can discern what the will of God is. In other words, the results of the testing should show you that you do understand the will of God. We want the will of God to just be this one-sentence, you know, answer. It's just not that way, right? Um, and you know, the word discern there in the Greek isn't, isn't really a, a word there. It's just the Greek would literally say, to prove by you what is the will of God. You see it in you, you know the will of God. That, that's literally what it says. If we have our minds renewed then, I believe this text is telling us we already know what God's will is because we have the mind of Christ. And again, once we were ignorant, we were slaves to former passions, but now our minds have been illumined. We see things we never saw before. And God's will, of course, doesn't exist on what, based on whether or not we can see it or understand it. God's will is God's will. But thanks be to God, he's revealed himself and made it possible for us to understand him. Ephesians 5 verse 15 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to please God, or, uh, sorry, that you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. God's will 
is not a secret. God's will is discernible. It's not only discernible, he wants us to know it and wants us to understand it. And keep in mind here, I want to help you be better Bible readers, which is why I stop and teach sometimes. This is one of those times, because we come across the will of God in some vernacular language of one or another, and we, we're trying to understand what it means. The Bible usually talks about God's will, even though there's just one will, in four different manners. Okay? The first is God's revealed will. We talked about this a lot in Core Doctrine this morning, looking at Job and things that he did not understand about God's will. But there are things that he did. God has a revealed will. This is what we clearly and plainly know about God. From God, his word is revealed, and that is his will. Creation reveals to us certain things about his will. Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, reveals to us the will of God. God wants to be known. He has made his will knowable. He has revealed himself, and through his revelations we know his will. But then there's also God's hidden will things that we don't know. God's given us enough, sufficient knowledge about him and his will, but there are things that he withholds on purpose. There are things we're not supposed to know about his will. Who can know the mind of the Lord? If we have figured out his mind, we've figured out that we got it wrong. That's what we figured out, right? We cannot, in our finite minds, know the infinite plans of an infinite God. So there are hidden parts of his will that the scripture speaks of. And then there's God's decreed will. Decreed will. This is a reference to what he says is going to happen. My will, I'm going to do this thing, it's as sure as concrete will set. <laughs> it's going to happen, right? If, if God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Regardless of sin, regardless of evil, regardless of the wickedness of the world, there are occasions where we read scripture and we see God says he's going to do something. That's his decreed will. It's going to happen, right? And then the last one is God's moral will, which we see a lot in the scripture and we, we sort of look at wrongly sometimes, but God has also told us to do things and not do things. This is his moral will concerning behavior and how the new Christian lives his life. We do forgive others who sin against us. That's part of God's moral will. We do not love money. That's also part of God's moral will. Does that make sense? When the Bible tells us how to live, we can also consider these things part of God's will. Now, let me give you an example of one that I think you'll be familiar with, and that's Matthew 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, verse 39. Jesus asks his disciples to pray with him. They go to a garden to do just that. His soul is weary and troubled. And verse 39 of Matthew 26 says, going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What do you think Jesus was referring to when he said, as you will? The revealed will, hidden will, decreed will, or moral will? the decreed will of God. If it be possible, I know that you have a decreed will as my father. What you're going to do, you're going to do. It's unchanging. It's perfect. I, I wouldn't for a second try to blow off your plan or find a way around it, but if it be possible, if there's any way in the agony of his soul, sweating drops of blood, if your decreed will, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. The text says his soul was very sorrowful even unto death. 
not as I will, but as you will. Jesus would be arrested shortly after this. He would not see another moment of rest until he breathed his final breath on the cross. It was the decreed will of God to send his son to the cross. There was no other way. God wrote this plan in eternity past, before Adam had ever sinned, before Jesus was ever born, to have a perfect, spotless lamb of God, his own beloved son, die as a substitute for sinners to rise from the dead and create a new, living, renewed people for himself. It had to be Jesus, and it had to be the cross. There was no other will. Friend, if you're a Christian this morning, or I'm sorry, if you're not a Christian this morning, here is God's will. Listen to it. Jesus died for sinners. God chose the perfect sacrifice of his son to bear your sin on the cross to absorb God's wrath and hot burning anger in all eternity in hell, thrown, hurled at his own son in your stead. This was and is God's will. And if you do not repent and confess your sins before God and turn to Christ and bow before him as king and Lord and worship him with your body and renew your mind as you were created to do, through the receiving of the gift of faith, you will be actively rejecting the decreed will of God from eternity past. Jesus said, I'd rather die than do. So, what is your will? Will you believe on the Lord Jesus and make this first step to parallel your own soul with God's plans to save you? Or will you continue in rebellion, rejecting him, and die in your sins, face God's wrath? Come to Jesus. Find yourself for the first time in your life in the will of God. If you are in Christ this morning, we have much to take away here because if God's will is knowable and we claim to know it, then we must make it our mission to effectively communicate God's will to others to see hearts transformed and to see minds renewed. God's truth changes fallen man and makes people come alive. God's truth keeps them alive until Jesus returns and makes all things new. So what is our mission? The same mission that every other church has that has encountered Jesus' truth. We share it. How do we share it? We make disciples. God's will for Main Street Baptist Church is to make disciples. God's will for Main Street Baptist Church is to evangelize the lost. God's will for Main Street Baptist Church is to pursue uh, national and foreign missions to see every nation come to submission under Christ. God's will for Main Street Baptist Church is to plant more churches that share God's truth. God's will for Main Street Baptist Church is to develop, to develop and to equip leaders to share God's truth with competency and skill. Now, I share those in particular because Mark Dever in a sermon recently said, churches usually get one or two of those okay and then let the others fall by the wayside. What are we good at? <laughs> what are we failing in? What are we struggling in? God's will for us through his spoken word and all the words that he's given us is to share this truth in all these various means to see the world transformed by the power of the gospel. So just two final thoughts. We'll be done here. How are we doing and where are we going? How are we doing and where are we going? And honestly, from my perspective, it feels difficult for me to evaluate publicly, at least this, this, in this moment. I think we're doing okay, but we've got a lot of room to grow. So instead of me just saying, here's what you're bad at, 
Let me just ask you some reflective questions. But besides, we're supposed to look for the good stuff anyway. That's what the testing is, right? Let me just ask you some thought-provoking questions, and you can decide how, how you're doing. Is your heart being transformed? Is your heart being transformed? Is your heart being transformed in your small group? As a result, meeting in someone's home, as we've done for a full year now, three different groups, are the hearts in those groups being changed radically through relational, uh, gospel-centered fellowship? Are you, as a small group leader, seeking to help our church and, and our members use their bodies as living sacrifices for the glory of God? Do you leave church services with a fresh urgency to give your all for Jesus and his kingdom and for the people around you? What about core doctrine? Is your mind being renewed through the things that we study in God's word? Are you falling more deeply in love with your maker as you learn more about him and his beauty and his majesty? Is the Bible making more sense to you than it used to? You're trying to understand how everything fits together. And do you now feel a new urgency, a new desire to help other people understand the Bible like you started to understand it? When was the last time you shared the gospel with someone? When was the last time you shared the gospel with someone well, you had another church member with you, and they watched you, or you watched another church member share the gospel. Have you invited anyone to church this last year since we replanted? Who is discipling you? Do you have a mentor? Do you have somebody who knows how you're growing, what your weaknesses are? Are you discipling somebody? Are you pouring God's truth into another believer, helping them grow in the faith and knowledge of Jesus? Are you a more mature Christian than you were this time last year? I'll let those hang. Now, where are we headed? Where are we headed? Well, as your lead elder, I see primary markers that I believe will make up the majority of 2023. Just three things. I think the first one is prayer. We're not going to stop praying. You know, we started the replant thing, like we're going to pray for six months, and we're going to have these fasting days, and then we're going to start the work stuff. We are still young. We don't need to feel like we've reached it. There are prayers still being answered today that we prayed at 6 o'clock in the morning on those front steps two years ago. There, there are prayers still being answered by the Lord from the founding charter members in 1964. You ever thought about that? The prayers that we utter in desperation to God today may be answered 100 years from now. May, may, the future of our church, we can say, is heavily pending on whether or not you and I are praying people. We started this Wednesday prayer time to make this a priority in our church, and we're going to do more stuff like that. We may need to teach one another how to pray more dependently. We, we may need to pray together um, more intentionally in small groups and, and in other facets. Every time we come together, we need to be praying. We must pray. Number two, I think 2023 will be largely involved with developing leaders. Developing leaders. And again, I say I think. The Lord didn't tell me this is what 23 is going to happen, right? What's going to happen in 2023? But I'm just looking at where we are. You know, we believe in a plurality of elders. Somebody say amen. We believe in deacon servants. Amen. 
We also believe that every single member of a local church ought to have a thriving, deliberate, meaningful, edifying gift of service that they give to the body. Got some amens on that one. That makes me happy. Yeah? If you don't have a thriving uh, ministry in this church that you are giving yourself to week in and week out, we, we got work to do, right? We want to equip you in that. Your job is not to just let the elders and the deacons do their thing. No one here needs to come fill out a form in order to start a Bible study. Nobody needs to fill out a form to clean the bathrooms. Nobody needs to fill out a form to help in the sound booth, to greet visitors or take people out to dinner or have people in your home or pray with someone. You don't have to fill out a form to do that. You don't need a title in front of your name. You don't need a position, an office. Do the stuff. We want to equip you and develop you into who Christ means. You are a gift to this body. Do you know that? From the, the, the weakest, as 1 Corinthians 12 would say, to the most public member, you all are considered as gifts given by Jesus uniquely for this time, for this people. What's, what's your gift? What are you, how are you giving to us? How are you helping? How are you serving? How can we help you serve? I believe leaders will be born 2020, 2023. Uh, 2023. The last one, <clears throat> a little cryptic. We're going to be wiggling doorknobs. 2023 will be full of wiggling doorknobs. Colossians 4, verse 2, Paul says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a, a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. You know, there's a lot of stuff we can do. I mean, you name it. We can have the Chinese menu, church, 100 different things. I love going to church's websites and click on the ministry tab, and the menu is as long as the screen, right? Like, <laughs> how y'all doing that? Was 70 people? What? <laughs> like, okay, uh, they got a ministry for everything. We, we're not, we're not going to be that church that has a ministry for everything, okay? That's not what we're trying to do here. But there are things that we can do, and things that we're gifted at and that we should pursue. So we wiggle the doorknobs, and the ones that Jesus opens, or the Lord opens to us to declare the word, we run through them, right? If the Lord has presented an opportunity that is clear and abundantly of his good design, and, and, and that he is just placed in our laps, like, don't check the handle two or three times. Run. Run through it. Don't hit, your, don't hit the door, you know? Run through it. God gives us a door for some kind of ministry that suits us for this time we run after. it. There will be other things that perhaps we feel underprepared for, but if the Lord has made a wide and obvious access for us to do that thing, we ought to do it. Those are the kinds of things that I look for because what they do is they showcase our weakness and the sovereign God who is strong, mighty, and whose arm is not too short, and who has unbelievable plans for small little churches in Spindale. Who knows what the next 58 years will bring, but I pray the Lord will open those doors now. Because whose will are we after? God's. Let's run after his will with all we have. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this just mind-blowing text. Challenges our thoughts, our bodies, our emotions, our wills to subject everything, all that we are, not just to subject, but to, to love, to worship with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray that as we take inventory of ourselves and we take inventory of our church, 
uh, Lord, that we would find the, the fruit of light that you have illumined our hearts and our minds with. And we would be encouraged that you are doing wonderful, amazing works here in this body to display your glory and your goodness to us. Pray for this next year that we wouldn't stop praying, that we would see new leaders rise, that we do the work to equip one another in ministry, disciple one another, share truth of God's word. And again, that it would show forth our weakness and the great strength of a mighty Savior. We trust you. All the words you have spoken, we will do. In Christ's name we pray.